and welcome to the AEW Dynamite Review. We are the Dadly Boys of What Culture. I'm Adam Wilborn, joined by Michael Hamlet and Michael Sidgwick, here to review everything that happened on last night's episode of AEW Dynamite. But before we get into it, if you're a fan of this sort of thing, make sure you subscribe to What Culture Wrestling on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, and YouTube. Uh... Where we do daily wrestling podcasts where we not only review AEW Dynamite, but also AEW Collision, Raw, SmackDown, the show formerly known as NXT 2.0. Oh! Pay-per-views, premium live events. We have interviews, roundtable discussions, and a roundup that we complete. We'll make a quiz, of course, on wrestle culture. As I said, they're joined by Hamlet and to review last night's AEW Dynamite and the Go Home Show ahead of AEW Grand Slam. Indeed. Um, I've been dreading this podcast because I actually quite liked and had a great time with some of the things on Dynamite last night. And in a subversion of the Raw preview and review, and SmackDown preview and review, and the NXT preview <laughs> and review, I know what it's going to feel like podcasting with a miserable bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Times two. Because you weren't quite so high on this, were you, Hamflet? No, I was bored. Um, but that's all right, because I love listening to your insights, and mm. I've got the best seat in the house for it. Aww. So, like, it's I have no problem, like, just, like, letting you go, and then not, like, sort of pissing on chips, because I didn't hate it. I didn't feel... Yeah. Anger in my soul for what I was watching. I felt like my time was being wasted slightly. I very much enjoyed the pretty much all of AW Post Forbidden Door. Like it really felt like it got its groove back and there was just focus. Uh, that's what I want. You know, when I talk about it, I just want direction. I just want to be in a few clues and be shown some other characters pissing about in things that matter. And this didn't have a lot of that. That was what that was what really stuck out to me on this. The big stories that they've been telling lately, didn't have the most exciting week, which you can't every yeah. week, that's yeah, fine. Yeah. But then what's supposed to happen when they have their quieter weeks is that you kind of notice, oh, there was other stuff on the come up that you could mm-hmm. be, and I wasn't, now it really brought us to life yeah. on that side of it either. I'd say I don't, it's one of those where I, my big take on AEW, I think I've had some good ones over the years, some incredible ones over the years. <laughs> <laughs> my take on AEW that I think holds true and is my, and it's been this way since I would say, Probably brawl out 2022, but there were problems mounting before that. Yeah. My broad take on AEW, my TLDR, here's the big state of the promotion addressed. I'm not going to dwell too much on that, don't worry, because uh, I didn't have a fun time with the show, is that most weeks, the atmosphere is really starting to impact the enjoyment of these shows. It's starting to feel a bit more stark, and that is another one. Every week, I watch either a 7 or an 8, or sometimes a 9 out of a 10 Dynamite. It's never a 10, it's never a 6 for me, really. Mm-hmm. I watch this show every week, and it's always a 7, an 8, or a 9 out of 10. More 7s and 8s than 9s. And I enjoy it, and I, some of it I find absolutely electrifying. And in the exact same breath, I reckon I could legitimately write a 100-point list about the problems in this company and how I'd resolve them. Mm. It's just that weird place that we live in with uh, AEW for whatever reason. It's the fact that it promises everything. It says it's the buffet. You have to hold it to an account. It's like they've got this God-given right to be the wrestling company. And when it lets you down in certain areas, it feels like a, you know, it almost feels like this sort of like ethical problem. They've just decided we're going to be, it's like the E is almost immaterial. Their whole thing now is we are all wrestling. Yeah. We are all wrestling. Mm-hmm. We'll do Lucha Libre. Yeah. We'll do state-of-the-art stuff. We'll sign every single free agent. We'll do blood. We'll do everything you could possibly want in this buffet. It's a responsibility for them almost. Um, so I feel like that's one of the reasons why it gets so scrutinized is because no, like there is the grifter circuit, there is the grifter mm-hmm. cottage industry, but away from that, it is possible to criticize and critique AEW in good faith because it appeals to, it seeks to appeal to absolutely everyone and there can never be a true consensus. It's going to let someone down invariably is an inevitable byproduct of its very business model. And this sort of entitlement, it feels, over all wrestling, as I said, that is immaterial. Oh, one of your things for tag team wrestling. All right, okay, well, you've you've messed that up then, haven't you? That's just one example of, I reckon I could get to 100. Mm. But on just this night alone, I had a really good time with this dynamite. Do you know, I was thinking about... Um with regards to AEW, and after yesterday, or, or another podcast we were doing where we were just talking about the that period of watching WWE when the rights fees were coming in, but the product was getting no better, and it was this real sense of, oh, well, this is it forever then. Yeah. Like, and that was what, one of the things mm. that's made this, like, kind of creative revolution so interesting in WWE. 
I'm not comparing the two at all. AW of 2024, Christ, AW of 2023 is light years better than, I don't know, pick a year, 2017? 2019. 2019, like the years when the billion dollar Smackdown contract yeah. was agreed. 2018, right, take that one. Like 2024, 2023, the worst AW thing you've ever seen, smokes that era of WWE, right? And yet, because we're in this all of this conversation about the rights fees and the, the deal they're going to get, and they're going to deserve, by the way, that they've got past tense. This is yeah. <laughs> this is AEW's version of that in the sense that that they could argue is proof of concept for their model. Yeah. So the the model that you've just described that I completely agree well, with it, I, has been part of has contributed to how they've earned that money in the same way that WWE's risible trash yeah. <laughs> contributed to theirs. So there is still something like if we talk about like how many masters AEW and it always tries to serve too many, mm-hmm. always like right. But it but the point is weirdly it does try to serve them. So it is trying to serve. Uh, billion dollar paymasters at the same time as workers on the internet. It, like Tony Khan <laughs> earnestly, I think, tries to serve masters from one end to the other and everybody in between. Yeah. You cannot do that, but it is very interesting to watch him try. And like sometimes he succeeds, yeah. which is remarkable. You can get a product that kind of makes you feel a bit let down or deflated and you can get Wembley in the same month. Mm. Well, let's get into the, let's get into this show. Uh, how did we call this one coming? Chris Jericho opening the show when we were, were discussing where he was going to land on this. We definitely said not the main event. Yeah, he knows better politically now. Uh, but he opened the show facing Orange Cassidy. Uh, you've got the rest of the conglomeration and the rest of Luring Tree out there. A uh, big fight to start, and then it leaves uh, Cassidy and Jericho in the ring. Everyone's brawling outside. Uh, Cassidy takes everyone out with a big sent on. Uh, as does uh, Mark Briscoe. Jericho teases a dive and does the... Hi, guys. Um, everyone brawls to the back, not involved in the match. Um, that allows Orange Cassidy to hit an orange punch for a great near fall very early on. Jericho goes to the outside. They fight out there. Cassidy gets sent over the barricade, hurdles it, and takes him out. Um, and in amongst all this, Chris Jericho takes the camera and films himself putting the boots to... Uh, Orange Cassidy before they head back inside. Cassidy fires back though. Stun Dog Millionaire, Mishinoku Driver. Um, Jericho gets back dropped outside. And uh, as Cassidy goes for another dive, Jericho blocks it, catapults him into the railing. Uh, and then uh, Chris Jericho back suplexes him off a loading case through a timekeeper's table uh, to take us to a break. When we come back, they're going back and forth. They both collapse simultaneously. Uh, Cassidy's in trouble, but he fights out of the corner. Diving crossbody around the world, DDT, but Jericho counters into the walls. Uh, Orange Cassidy gets to the ropes, and uh, Jericho takes the ref, and in flies Big Bill with a big boot uh, to get a two count for Chris Jericho. But O'Reilly fights him to the back. Um, Jericho fires off a Death Valley driver, uh, but Cassidy desperately grabs a DDT, round the world DDT, and a third DDT uh, off the top. Goes to the orange punch, but it gets hit with a code breaker out of nowhere from uh, Chris Jericho for a two count. Cassidy, though, dodges the Judas effect, hits beach break, but Jericho kicks out this time. Brian Keith runs down. Mark Briscoe fights him off. Uh, in amongst all this, Jericho reveals he's got a roll of change in his hands. That's uh, really cute. It's yeah. a nice touch. And Cassidy... That's, like, really cute. We had a better booking thing, which was uh, he gets knocked over and loads of coins fall out, fall out of his pants. Uh, like Sonic. That rings, yeah, people could make the animation. Um, but Cassidy knocks the roll of change out of his hand, hits an orange punch, and gets the one, two, three. This match acted as the most compelling exhibit of evidence yet that Chris Jericho needs to go away. Okay. And not because it was bad. No. Right. I, mm-hmm. In the arena, this considering like uh, there's, this, there's, a, there's a curve now, it's never going to feel like 2021 until it does, and right now, it doesn't. Mm. For that amount of people, this match was, like, really well received. Got, this is always some chance. Got, this is, I mean, a lot of things do, but that felt like an actual pulse behind those chants. Yeah, it yeah. felt like they felt like they had them all in the palm of their hand. Um, and, you know, it's one of those, it's like, do you consider what the internet says? Is X just a bubble? Um, is it different as a live experience when you're more willing to just go and enjoy yourself and just park your cynical thoughts on Chris Jericho because you're just watching a really good match Mm -hmm. kind of out of nowhere on Chris Jericho's 2024 form and you just get swept up in it because you're there. Who do you listen to? Um, Because I was thoroughly entertained and engrossed by this Chris Jericho match, truly. And I hopped online after watching Dynamite just to see the the temperature, as we all do. And I saw the memes of, like, you know, the badly drawn horse becoming, like, a really nicely rendered one. And then (laughs) first hour of Dynamite and then the second hour of Dynamite. And I'm thinking, 
what? Like, this is a really hot match with some really cool details. Like, the rule of quarters was just yeah. the absolute perfect way to do the foreign object spot, given what the story told thus far has been. Like, they worked really, really hard. Like, Chris Jericho hasn't hit a code breaker as flush as that mm. in AEW, I don't think. I'm serious. Like, even when he was, like, well-liked, an entertainment machine as the Le Champion, mm. uh, he's never hit one that flush. Like, they clicked big time. I thought the pacing was borderline immaculate in terms of how they managed, like, the orange punch into the walls which is another move and another counter that Chris Jericho, it can sometimes look a bit trickly and clunky. It just looks pretty awesome to my eyes. And I'm not really prepared to like Chris Jericho yeah. that much. And yet you still have that online reaction. And that's, I don't know how much that matters, but if he still got this sort of match in him, which I thought was very well paced, it clicked really well. Execution was for Jericho's twenty twenty four standards, like outstanding, and paced brilliantly, and dramatic. And you didn't really know who was going to win. This is a really, 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 really strong TV match, and f quite rightly, considering you don't just get away with it for having one good match on Dynamite, considering you know a really strong Dynamite match is the standard. People, and maybe it's just my the way my social media activity is curated. No one can be arsed with even Chris yeah. Jericho outperforming, you know? Oh, word on that. Yeah, I, I, this, this match, for me, anyway, sort of personified my experience of large parts of Dynamite. The, the latter stage is less so, and Ricochet, which we'll get to. I can't remember his opponent was, but I'm sure you'll help me out with that one. Yeah. Um, because like you say, I watched this this morning. Kind of hot as balls. And this this pang of guilt came across me because I hear that this is awesome, Chance, and I don't have the uh, Michael Hamflet, Edge, AJ Styles reaction of like, why the hell are you chanting that sort of thing? Watch the match. Mm. <laughs> Toilet. Um, but I, yeah, like you say, Sige, I sort of, yeah, exemplify what you're talking about there because they said that and I thought, boy, yeah, these are really going for it and I can in appreciate the work that they're doing. I feel nothing for this match. I felt, I know, and I felt like I should, like you say, for the the well worked spots or the planned out bits with the the roller quarters. The or actual whatever. like sharp intakes of breath. Yeah. Oh, he's countering that with that. It was it's a really strong match. This you have helped me out there because I felt nothing for this as well, and the, and it's kind of my core problem with a lot of stuff on this dynamite. Truthfully, is that I felt nothing for a lot of the people I was watching, and I and unfortunately I include Jericho and Orange Cassidy in that. I'm going to give Jericho the benefit of the doubt briefly, but then I want to talk about Orange Cassidy after rather than, like, Sidge has nailed what was actually, like, objectively very good about mm -hmm. the match mm -hmm. that was happening in front of us. Like, we talk sometimes about the viewing experience. I got back from a gig very late at half two last night. And you can write off your takes on this. I was up at half five to watch this with the matchsticks in the eyes, and I'm watching this thinking, I don't care, but that's why I'm going to give it the benefit of the doubt, you know, like, and I'm, if something's going to bring us into life, then it's going to be tremendous. But why does my heart feel so bored? <laughs> More like. He went to see Moby last night. Yeah, that's yeah, why, that's, yeah, why yeah. that's good and makes sense. Probably because he grew up living, uh, loving the World Wrestling Federation. <laughs> Ooh, Lordy, <laughs> love the Fed. <laughs> no, nobody knows why no one likes the Fed. How was, the night, how was Moby? Uh, really good. <laughs> oh, cool. like, really, really good. Like a proper good um, turn. career retrospective <laughs> sort of thing. Like, so book ended the whole, like, did most of play in the middle, which was a massive commercial success. Like, realistically, even bigger than you imagine. Like, he does, it was a really small venue, and his tickets weren't, like, priced mm. crazy. So you follow that one that sloped. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. went to see Corn there. Oh. Yes, I, I went to see Corn on say their issues tour. Like, a thousand and change attendance, maybe less. Like, but, like, relatively small for a guy that obviously made millions and billions from this album. Give all of it to, like, all of the proceeds from it to some animal charity or whatever, because that's his thing. That's mm. what he's into. So he's not doing it for profit or anything. And it was just a nice sort of retrospective thing and made me think, ah, oh, I liked it a bit more than I even realised. Started and ended with Rave and there was people even older than me, because we were all in our 30s. Fact, we're on our 30s. On our 30s. Like, having, like... Uh, 39 on Sunday. Oh, yeah. 39. They were... Imagine being 39, Amphler. <laughs> I never know, man. I, uh, there was people I enjoying... Know who was age, you? So, yeah, <laughs> I have legitimately forgot this before. Like in 37, 38, 39, it really just can sort yeah. of blend into one. But yeah, there were people enjoying things other than booze who looked about between 50 and 60 and or 
a proper acid house. Yeah, but for there for Moby's first run in the early 90s, and or we're going to have to enjoy it for the duration of the gig and then head home and relieve the babysitter. <laughs> it, was that sort of, it was that kind of... Um, so if they weren't enjoying something other than booze, maybe they could have been, uh, I don't know, Sage, what, what could they have said? So. Poppers. <laughs> no, no, that's it reeked of it, man. Poppers. It reeked of it. Have the told us it was uh, poppers. That was it, because they needed like a couple of hours and then, well, got to clean themselves up. Like, So I was quite tired, but... It was uh, the the Jericho thing. Yeah, I was watching this thing, and this is not a piece of Jericho brand garbage that mm. we've become accustomed to this year, especially Jericho brand garbage, just like you, <laughs> just, just like you remember, just like you stuck with it. However, um, I yet again like stick Orange Cassidy on the list that I think ultimately has benefited not a jot from being in the Jericho vortex, working with Christian. This has been a waste of all of our time, truthfully. Like. The match, the bits of the match that you can put over is like something like the roller quarters, a nice callback to something that has happened. Like, was it worth it? I, I, I would say no. None of this was worth. That's it. That's never worth. <laughs> it was, it was a reminder, maybe when a reminder is needed, that um, not every match needs a story, but it helps to throw. Something. Every match has a story yeah, because every, matches, ma- every match has a story. Every match has a story. Mm. But a bit of bollocks sometimes. Better and worse, and in this case, it was worse. All the bollocks was useless between these two, mostly. It does help the match get over. It can help the match get over. You've got, like, Orange Cassidy's been floating for a while, Jericho's Jericho, and yet you had the, something like the roller quarters. You had a little bit of needle between them because of what's gone on. The segments might have been trash, but the fans were invested as a result. So it had that going for it, but, oh, man, Orange Cassidy, this has been, an, I would say, it's been a net negative. I think it's just he was, he, was really, he was a bit aimless before. Now he's done something cool. He's aimless. And fun and dramatic. I don't know. I just. It's I not been a net negative. He's not been ruined. It's over now, this. this, isn't it? Please. It was never um, over. It was over a bit in the match, but right. It was very over. For what I it think it's been now. a net negative. I think, I like, what was he doing beforehand, realistically? He's just been pissing about in the conglomeration. I guess. You cannot blame Jericho in this program with where Orange Cassidy is right now. He's very, very aimless as a character. Chris Jericho's not in sole booking charge of Orange Cassidy's direction. This is the hottest singles TV match he's had in, and I can remember anyway. So it's absolutely not a net negative. There is a time and a place to bury Chris Jericho, and it's often richly deserved. <laughs> not here. Well, it's not as if he was a hot act that Jericho was glommed on to. Oh, I'm not, this is a, a very different kind of Jericho ruination. Like, this is not, yeah, it's not a Daniel Garcia or a Sammy Guevara or a Ricky Starks or, you know, like the people where you're like, oh, they're on the rise, they're on the rise. This is different, but it's okay to want Orange Cassidy to be there and work with a big It's Tony star, Khan's fault. Work with a big star and go to there. It's Tony Khan's That's fault. That's fair enough. Yeah, yeah I'm the, not necessarily... He's in the, he's in the Khan vortex. <laughs> <laughs> second, we got, a second vortex. And we got a new game for... Standing up for Chris Jericho. <laughs> And we got a new game for for next week. Who's Jericho going to glom onto next? Ugh. Big Bill. Oh please, yeah, it's, it's time for that, isn't it? Like they did the setting up the turn in the middle of this story. People on Twitter suspected it was a write off for a while, for a little while, a little while while he does his little fuzzy tour. <laughs> a little fuzzy tour. Uh, we did s- a decent number in uh, London for that. Not these hours, but yeah. decent little number, decent little show. We see footage of. Uh, I mean, are they the BCC anymore? Mox's gang backstage. Um, they're going to go with the greater good, I think, aren't they? I love how, like, the punters um, on, like, sort of the eve of All In were basically faced with a choice. And they went, I don't want to hear this really abrasive, loud voice doing an impression of something else. I'll go and watch Adam Wilborn. <laughs> <laughs> and not Chris Jericho try and be an 80s hair metal singer. So uh, Pac asks where we you has been since All Out uh, and reveals next week they've got a title defence. Time to come to work, Uta. Uh, Claudio said he's not mad, he's just disappointed. He thought he taught Uta better. Uh, and Castiglione told, um, told him to do him this favour, show up, defend the titles. Mox says, look, I know it's difficult. You've got your own choice. You can stay or leave. You're not you know, stuck here. You can do what you like. Um, you've got a responsibility for the greater good to look at yourself in the mirror, though, every morning. What kind of man do you want to be? And then Alex Marvez, I'll just do this all together and one can talk about it, catches up with you, uh, who's... Uh, He's got the best hair. Yeah. Who's leaving the arena. I don't know if I could swap hair with anyone in AEW, it would be there, Wheeler Yuta. Mm. Jamie Hayer. Big bouncy hair like that. MJF, probably. It's brand new, isn't it? Built to last. <laughs> 
you uh, get stopped by Marvez though, uh, and ask uh, gets asked his thoughts on on what was said. He said, "Look, he's very conflicted. He's had to wrestle his whole life to be a champion, and if that means he have to he has to show himself at Wrestle Dream." And Marvez corrects him, "It's Grand Slam next week, mate." Um, <laughs> in amongst all this, must be patronised by Alex Marvez. <laughs> Made. <laughs> <laughs> also, a stagehand runs up and says, "Oh, you left this, and it was his trio's title." And you just says his head's been all over the place. But if the other guys want a favour, then next week he'll kick whoever's ass is necessary. Right. I broadly li- like the direction. I like the fact that there is a direction. We liked it on Collage, didn't we? Liked it on Collage. One of the few things we liked on Collage. <laughs> um, and it's. Good and it makes sense, and I like the idea of well, no offense, Wheeler Utah, but you're gonna get seven shades of kicked out of you and you're gonna bleed again, and it's gonna be pretty horrifying, hopefully. Um, but I want it to happen, and I think you want it to happen as well. Yes, they are in danger of turning him into Mr. Bean, and that's not a very good idea. It's one thing, us Brits and our bloody obsession with Mr. So Bean looking at it. Obviously, you haven't caught up on collision yet, yes, but you will, yeah, Thursdays. I do, I, do, I, do, I, do, I do enjoy collision on the big telly because yeah. by then it's been spoiled. I yeah. do like that. So, spoiler alert, you've seen the direction. He makes some intentional errors in the match mm-hmm. to, you know, convey the fact that his head's just completely torn and he's not focused because his loyalties are divided and he doesn't know what to do with himself. Him basically making a mistake <laughs> in every minute of his life is laying it on a little bit thick for yes. me, to the point where it's like he's Mr. Bean. He's, he's really, he's, you've forgotten to put trousers yeah, on. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Mr. Wheel. Where's your belt? You don't even know what day it is. Like, come on. I, I get it. I get it. I get it. Was that part of him leaving just the show one, 20 just minutes one. in? Where are you going? You, the show's only just started. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Which button do I press again, boys? <laughs> Turns up to Dynamite, walks in the locker room, puts his belt down, goes in and he's like, so let's go to leave. Love it's like, he walks into the arena and like he's looking sort of around, sir, this is the impact zone. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm in the wrong bloody promotion now. God, I can't do anything right. Well, uh, he kicks up and the forbidden door and debuts in NXT as, as a shoot. <laughs> yeah, I could do with one mistake or lapse in judgment or whatever per TV appearance. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. It doesn't have to be a clown. <laughs> Two back-to-back like the belt and the, the show, yeah. Tell you what, mine, uh, Pac stole the promo, didn't he? Time to come to work. <laughs> like, I thought he was better than Claudio and Mox. Yeah. Mm. Pac was great. Like, he's, he's sinister. Yeah, he's, he's relish, enjoying he's this, relish, you can this, tell, yeah. yeah. Time to come to work. Time to come to graft. That's what we call it. Well, that's what, like, real men call it up here. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing for, you for graft? Ah, oh, just... Like the tit or whatever. Uh, he's NXT. not a catering, he's in bait. <laughs> NXT preview or whatever. <laughs> I know that, like, part of pa- <laughs> Pac's bastard uh, aesthetic is his ability to brood, like, behind his uh, his fringe or his bangs or his long hair. His bangs? What the hell's that? Shave it, off. Shave it off. Shave it off. Go bald like the others. Just be funny. Like, <laughs> I just, like, bald pack next week, just with uh, Mox and Claudio. <laughs> and, that, and that becomes, like, a Utah thing. Well, you want to join us? I'll do it. Let me go get my razor. Oh, I forgot it. Oh, my God. <laughs> just shave my pubes. <laughs> <laughs> Comes back. Yes, comes <laughs> uh, did I do it, guys? <laughs> well, that's that character ruined. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> you know, we're saying the tights with Tony Nese revealing the abs. He's got tights that reveal, like, no bush. <laughs> All right. No He's bush. No bush. No bush. on, basically. <laughs> I'm ready to work. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> My pubes just like, I heard it, you're loud and clear, Mox. No pubes. <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> but it's their fault. <laughs> A lot of people are really enjoying that direction. I am too, broadly. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> are, you hey, yeah, yeah. are you with us or against us? He's in. He wheeler. He wheels, wheels. Yes, Mox? He w- did he do what we asked? <laughs> Yep, no pubes, just like you asked. <laughs> what? <laughs> Mr. Carry the Mr. Bean thing a little bit for every big turkey on his head. <laughs> Is this what you needed from me? <laughs> 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 yeah, well. <laughs> yeah, it's a bullet on the last one, I suppose, isn't it? <laughs> this is your preview bullet point next week, but Willie, who knows shave his pubes? 
<laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I, I encourage this. It's my fault. That is quite something. <laughs> it's good stuff. <laughs> FDW champion Hook was in action next uh, against JD Inc. I assume he got his name after. Uh, I love this and I hate it at the same time. I've got a new gimmick. It's get loads of tattoos and. All right, okay, well, I'll get you the squash match on uh, on dynamite if yeah. you like. Is it worth it? <laughs> <laughs> I think at least we know that he respects your business. Did you see one on that bike? Yeah, 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 yeah. A dead man on dynamite. Worst thing is that the dick would have zero respect. For <laughs> he would wrap a steel chair right around his head, a full of force. <laughs> Roddy Strong's on commentary. Nice thing, shake my hand. Get the hell off of me, <laughs> you mark, you mark. Get it removed. <laughs> Replace it with the cane one. Get it removed. Okay. Oh, so you don't <laughs> like old dick no more? Is that it? Uh, Hey, Michelle, look at this guy's tattoos. What do you think? Oh, I like that. I'll take a one. She likes it. Get it back. <laughs> I would never. You'd never catch me covering up one of my tattoos. That's for damn show. <laughs> See, Luther Reigns now. Sh- son. <laughs> Shut up and <laughs> replace it with the Grim Reaper. <laughs> you know, it was it Sarah? Yeah. Oh, that wasn't. That was another wife, wasn't it? Not yeah, the, uh, you were yeah. always on my mind because you could have done like thing. you could have married that image with them um, with the soundtrack of your uh, Sarah by Jefferson Starship. No, oh. Sarah, Sarah, it's great. It's all over. <laughs> <laughs> you <laughs> heard me again. Uh, <laughs> he just gets a new tattoo. It's just a shark across the neck. I think it might be a little bit too eighties for you. Yeah. So it doesn't have that. Uh, Skeevy energy of the scorpions. Yeah. It's very soft rock, but it appeals to my yachty sensibility. I was going to say yacht rock. My yeah. yachty sensibilities. It's not quite, is it on the yacht? I don't know. You could put him. What are you on about? Yes, you're talking about your sensibilities whilst he's drinking. <laughs> it's my bottle of Beetlejuice. Be- Beetlejuice pop. <laughs> yeah, I think you might have slightly different uh, preferences you two. I went in the shop to get some chewing gum this morning, as we've discussed. I always look at the fridge just in case. Beetlejuice flavor. <laughs> Why is it green? So it's lunch today. <laughs> yeah. Lunch watch is uh, Cheez-Its and Beetlejuice flavor pop. <laughs> right. Oh, sorry, sorry. <clears throat> Yanks. <laughs> Beetlejuice flavor of soda. Yeah. Uh, hooks. Weird when some of them call it pop. I think it's Midwest in Canada say pop. Oh, do they? It doesn't sound right. I like want to drink a pop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's exactly how they do it. Uh, hooks squash. Better than we've talked about this, sorry. Better than uh, the Scottish. Oh, God. Uh, fizzy juice. I was having some fizzy juice. Fizzy just ju- now. Fizzy juice just now. It's pure fizzy. Fizzy juice. Implied. It's like such a... It's like, that's, that's more American than soda, really. That's fizzy like, juice. It's like all the juice goes through a soda stream, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, So weird. Uh, hook squash JD Inc. Uh, uh, and strong... Crunchy bread? That's just toast. <laughs> On these mats, so they're calling it essentially <laughs> crunchy, crunchy bread, crunchy bread. Put on that uh, crunchy bread just now. <laughs> Sliced fried potatoes, <laughs> chips. <laughs> the biggest fizzy juice. I can't even spell it right. What's Ernbra? <laughs> delicious as well. It's, it's a capital, isn't it? <laughs> you ever have iron brew hot? What? It was like a spicy flavoured iron brew. Uh, I thought you meant you actually boiled it. And I, which I wouldn't put Oh, yeah, here. I thought that. I thought you meant like hot ribena. Well, that'd be like reduced. Well, I know, but people cook with pop, don't they? So it's probably the same. Like cola hams and yeah, yeah. such. Cola ham, that sounds like a nickname you'd give me. <laughs> hey, cola ham. Hey, it's cola Drinking his pop. Uh, drink, hey, you drink soda much? <laughs> Drinking his pop and picking the one sandwich in Tesco's he can buy. <laughs> Huge pop in the office this morning when uh, Scott slightly stumbled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you, you say, hey, walk much? Hey, fall over much? <laughs> it's been that kind of day. God. Uh, thoughts on Hook's match? None. Yeah, no. thoughts so. <laughs> Not one. Obligatory TV segment. They're obviously going to face off next week at Grand Slam. Collision or Rampage? Uh, Are we doing Collision there? Yeah, I think Collision is... Yeah, I think the, 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 yeah, it must be the same night, one would assume. So I think they're taping Collision, and that match is going to go on there from what I've heard. F- Five-hour taping? 
don't know. No, she, no, the best of the vibe, I guess. I think it is Dynamite and Collision. I'm is pretty it? sure I've seen it on a poster. Oh, right, okay. I preview that one. Because they like, they've done Grand Slam Rampage and Grand Slam Collision every time they've been at Arthur Ashe, haven't they? They've done at least two shows out of it. Did they do yeah, Grand Slam one. Collision? Yeah, I think so. I can't remember. We'll look into it. If it even if you have to top the top bit or whatever. FTR versus House of Black or whatever. <laughs> the visuals are still nice on this like stage. It or whatever. Wasn't there like a massive guest star on the Collision one last year and it was weird that they put him on Collision and it was like spoiled on Twitter and it was like, tune in on... It's like Great Mooter on with Sting last year on Collision. Nah, man, that was Rampage. Rampage. That was 2022, I want to say. That was the year that Soraya debuted on the Dynamite. 2022. Oh, I want to say that, yeah. I do right, want yeah. to say it. Uh, night two. Yeah, it was Rampage. So not no Collision last year. No on collision, collision last year. Not so. two-hour Rampage, historically. That was their Punk Hobbs. Yeah. Then they did Hobbs Starks the year after. God, oh, yeah. After the toying. Uh, four-way tag match for an ROH World Tag Team Championship match at Wrestle Dream. The Righteous versus Best Friends versus The Kingdom versus The Hardys last year. Ah, great match. <laughs> Those absolutely terrible acting dorks. And the righteous. <laughs> Alex Marvez is backstage. Um, private party want to oh, oh, get in a trios titles match next week. Um, after they're running with the BCC last week, Another, of course. And they're really hard fought, competitive, big time win on collision, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, Isaiah Cassidy says... Which they, is just dark elevation on TV. I'm sick of it. They'll find a partner. But um, if Moxie wants a fight, we'll bring you a fight, basically. Um... Renee's backstage with the patriarchy. Christian Cage is there. Uh, Kill switch. Nick Wayne. Nick Wayne's mom, of course, is uh, yeah, Gary 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 Gordon Gordon Wayne. Uh, and Cage talks about his son, Nick Wayne, who's got a four-way on Rampage. Rocky Romero, Leo Rush, and Kip Sabian um, says it's a big match. He's decided Cage has that he wants to hold double gold with Wayne after he cashes in this contract of his. Um, mentions Renee's husband, John Mox. Obviously, might have something to say about that. Um, and he makes Renee refer to him as the undisputed future uh, AW world champion. And then he storms off because he spies Kip Sabian trying to come in. I've had a question from Travis. Okay. AEW one, and I've failed to address it on Twitter, but I think it's worth a very quick uh, detour. It's just weird how AEW has kind of become just every US cable wrestling show and this quasi or ostensible Money in the back, money in the bank briefcase is part of it. I don't like it. I think it's if it's anyone except Christian Cage, who people just love. I think he's one of the most unanimously everyone I don't know anyone who doesn't like Christian Cage's character or work in AEW. Mm. He's one of the people who just never really seems to get criticism, universally love to hate, you know? Yeah. And I think the fact that he's the one who carries it obscures that oh, it's a bit lame this. Same it's with MJF from the chip. Yeah. Because they were teasing that as well as a cash-in. Yeah. Um, then he just did it in advance, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. I, I, like he was trying to prove that he was going to be honourable. Yeah, he? the short answer, Travis, thank you for your question, is uh, philosophically, I hate it. I would have hated it a lot more had it been introduced two or three years ago, but one of the drums I keep banging is they've done so much of this sub-fed stuff, this every TV company does it, every TV property does it, like, there was just a DQ on the show. You know what I mean? Mm. Champions getting beat on the show like they got beat to set up or to build interest, air quotes, in the match at uh, All Out because the BCC beat the Bucks in an eight-man, I want to say, on the so, collision. Yeah. Just all these things have just infested AEW, and it's one of those where it accounts for a lot of my malaise, and it's the sort of thing that, because there's so much of it, when they just add a new one, into it, you don't really consider yeah. that. Ah, oh, it's wrong. This it's not sporting. So that, but Christian Cage holding it obscures the fact that there's not much outcry. Having said that, you are spot on with the take that uh, some show eventually we are going to have a match for presumably Daniel Brian Daniel. The mean the ends will justify the means with an amazing sub ten minute title match. Indeed, for Christian Cage. Indeed. Uh, and uh, oh, sorry, just cut her off here. Christian Cage. I like to think it's written around that exact yeah. scenario. That's the reason why they've done this rather yeah. than the other way around. Like, what could we do? I think it's next week. Actually, no, that's a lie because they did it at uh, World's End, man. They've already that's done it. Point. That's not a title match I next think week, it's is next it? Next week. Yeah. I Good think shout. Brian just gets past Nigel. It's brutal. Be the shake hands are. That ends however it ends. 
and push and tries it there and then. And it feels grand slam and hot. And That's whatever. a good point. Yeah, that's why you get a title match, I suppose. Yeah, everyone's happy, really. It, it's going to be a funny bit that, like, hey, we couldn't even technically advertise Brian for one match. And he's worked too. <laughs> <laughs> Not another one. Please, <laughs> another one. I love it. That old wrestling. Uh, just a word on Kip Sabian. Cage says, I don't care if your father's dead. If you keep bothering Nick, I'll put you in the ground next to him. Uh, one, uh, yet another great Cage <laughs> line. Another one. Two, how low must this guy be on Christian Cage's order of priorities that he can't even do it with any kind of sadistic glee? That yeah. I, I don't even care that your dad's dead. <laughs> it's just Christian saying that. Yeah. That's like a really, really, really funny bit of uh, comedic subtext. I... I'm into this. It's the simplest way to, it might not work, but it is the simplest way to just try and get somebody over kind of out of nothing. Think friggin', or even if not get them over, get them used in a way that they one day might be meaningful. The best example I can summon off the top of my head is Carlito in the Judgment Day. Same sort of thing. Just stick him there. How can this character interact with this very established and very overact? And will it work? And it might. Do you know like it's? I like Kip Sabian. But have a thought about him for the past, like, pretty much since Pac beat him after he took the box off his head. No, not really. Um, I'm sort of leaning in, and it might work. Then we got, uh, let's just check my notes here, Sige. Uh, the only women's match on the show, it was uh, the AW Women's World Champion, Mariah May and Serena D versus Queen Aminata and Yuka Sakazaki. Um, I'll be honest, Mariah May initially wasn't really bothered about this match. She could let Deeb take over, take control, uh, she did. <laughs> Deeb just dominated. You know what I mean? Yeah. She up, did. You can't do that. Beat up Queen Aminata's leg, dragon screw through the ropes, May's just posing on the steps uh, with but the But things title. are still going fine. Like, things are going... Yeah. Like, Mariah May's master plan has worked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but May comes in after a blind tag, um, snap drop kick, knocks Sakazaki to the floor, uh, and then mocks her as we go to a break. When we come back, Sakazaki gets the hot tag, um, Northern Lights bomb on Serena Deeb, uh, stacks May on top with a suplex. Uh, as a thrust kick to Deeb, gets a nice near fall. Everyone hits a release German suplex. Sakazaki hits a merry-go-round hammerlock slam on Deeb. Um, everyone goes to the outside, and Sakazaki dives onto everyone there, goes back in uh, and hits the magical girl splash on Deeb, makes the cover, but Mariah May just, as she's getting countered, dives in and nails her with the women's title from behind for the DQ. Uh, Post-match, she whips her with the title, kissed her on the cheek, and stands tall, and then we get a video package of Mina Shirakawa saying she hasn't heard from May in months. She's changed, but she still misses her. They had so many good times together. They can have more. May has got a place in her heart and tells the AW fans to get ready. Mina is coming. Yeah, God, this match was bleak. God, this match was bleak. Structurally crap how the heel, one of the heels elects not to do anything, and then the other heel just handily has control of the match. And the action was kind of mediocre. The atmosphere was, uh, you can hear a rare piss on carton. You know, I will say, though, for Serena Deeb, it's a good job that she's a professor. It's a really good job that she's a professor because, you know, a professor likes to, you know, study and have some reading material. And uh, this crowd, very charitably, given that she's a professor, handed her a copy of Brett East Nellis' debut novel because they gave her less than zero. There's a bit. <laughs> like, she was a there is a bit during picture in picture where it's one of those like hidden sort of gems if you you know watch it on fight slash thriller um here in the UK uh you get to watch like some really goated bit of crowd interaction right there was the the most recent one off the top of my head was Roddy Strong going to one side of the ring looking under I'm gonna get a table and the crowd are going oh we want tables and he goes, ah, can't find it. I, I, I left it on the other side. And he did it three more times. <laughs> and it was goaded. And by the time, he timed it to perfection. Because the time, it was like, oh, welcome back to Dynamite. Uh, <laughs> the crowd were like, ah, you little sh <laughs> I wanted to see a f***ing table and you've ruined that. And they were really loud and like berating them. But if you're watching in the States, mm. for all intents and purposes, there's been some really cool stuff yeah. happening and the action is like at a fever pitch. Hold 966, arm bar. And yeah. It's just been Jericho prodding away. Yeah. Yeah. Serena Deeb tries to do some heel taunts and he could hear a rare piss on Carton. It was desolate. It was absolute performance center 2020, desolate. And by the time that the action got, ah, 
It's the noise I would describe. Ah, mm-hmm. Some suplexes, some decent angles. You just got this absolutely terrible finish, the likes of which would be considered a disgrace to the sport in like, uh, no, just off the top of my head, February 2020. Oh, I had such a sad time watching this, and yet again, I keep saying these things, and they continue to be true. Sometimes I'll do a victory lap. I'm an artist in the graveyard. She doesn't deserve to be in the graveyard. She is in that. Oh, I was expected to care about her, and guess what? I kind of did when she first burst on the scene. Now, I've been conditioned not to give her a single toss because she's never on television, and now you suddenly put her on TV and expect to get the same reaction five months later. It's an absolute disgrace a piss take, and I just feel so bad for someone so cool. She got nothing, and she's class, and she deserves a push. And maybe you could, I don't know, you can maybe accommodate these wrestlers, and you could actually follow through on these pushes and these promising debut appearances by, I don't know, putting one more than f-ing one more match on the show. We booked this better, didn't we, yesterday? Yeah. I, I'm not as low. I believe, right, that there is... This is grim. Yeah, oh, don't get me wrong, as a as a sort of as another reminder of the work that is still to be done. It's exactly the same as when we're kind of like burying, and I think more people should bury in a, like, a lot of the women's matches in WWE, yeah. playing out to silence, library crowds, unover characters, the whole deal. You're having that again here. Um I'm not my default setting to a DQ or a count out, and this is not just because I like the Fed, is not that it's that it's not like I, I can it's tolerate the whole thing. I not necessarily the DQ, which yeah. I'm still not in favour uh, of. A lot of people think that they should have just held themselves to that initial standard of never. And I do understand that because WWE bastardized it. I'm all right with the DQ and count out in the right context. Same. I want to make that abundantly yeah, sorry, clear. Yeah, I'm not saying that about you, but I just I understand that people will immediately race to DQ equals bad. Whereas I think there is sometimes in character reasons to hmm. delay or make it part of the story. And I think that was the attempt here. But they didn't even really do a good job of telling the story in the match, let alone between Mariah May um, well, sort of my mate as champion brackets general, really. There's no obvious direction of what kind of champion she is. Is she a coward or is she an ass kicker? Is she a poser? Yeah. They've been so wishy-washy with what her character is based on what they kind of dream up for her that week as a bit. So her, if she was a character that at this point had kind of shown in matches glimpses of being a little bit of a phony faker, a little bit of a honky-tonk man, a Dominic Mysterio, then it's like... That character can justify a DQ with the belt because sooner or later the air is only pretending to yeah. be condescending towards you because Zach is like, she's actually frightened. She, a lot of times she kicks ass. Like she drills people with these really hard strikes. She She'll wins get clean. She wins clean. She gets involved in suplex battles. She hatches a plan in this match and the match because it's a bit of an AEW agented match goes 50 50 anyway. Mm. If Yuka is just like, it's mo- the, the autopilot is bad. Got- the autopilot that you just talked about, it's like a default setting. Yeah. If it makes sense or doesn't. You have to age it. it. We, wouldn't even think, we didn't even think about this beforehand. We were just talking about the match and sort of, yeah, sharing shower, it with this sort of, yeah, this sad indifference that we anticipate what was going to happen. And we just came up with, right, well, the story they told on college is Serena Deeb attacked Queen Aminata and injured her leg. In this match, Aminata gets her leg injured again by Serena Deeb. Unfortunately, has to leave the match. And they're like, great, two-on-one with Yuka Sakazaki. And then you see, oh, no, that's really not as easy as it is. And Mariah May goes, I don't want any part of this. And then she beats, Yuka beats Serena Deep. job done. Or that's a DQ finish. Or you, yeah. or even then two, then or even one, she's going to yeah. have to panic and she smashes it with a belt. Uh-huh. But again, you've got to work to that story. They've not done it in the build with the promos or the interactions. Just that 50-50 autopilot, is, uh, it's been a problem for a long time as well. One, one, one for the hundred. I really, <laughs> and then I really enjoyed the show. Eight yeah. out of ten for me, this. I'm not taking the piss. No, but sometimes the experience is better than some of its parts on a wrestling show, isn't it? You know, you can pick at stuff and still love the overall energy. I it's an AEW-specific problem. Mm. Like fundamental, deep-rooted. It's a rot in the creative. And yeah, I still think it's really, really good most weeks. Mm. But a women's match in the first weird, hour. Weird promotion. Um, no ladies' night, because surprisingly, Michael Hamlet wasn't here yesterday. Um, right, let's move on to... I was in the office at 7 a.m. Did a full work day. We did say that, didn't we? It's time to start smashing some narratives. <laughs> uh, we get a r- 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 remix of the uh, promo. I think, I think Mr. Hamford protests too much. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't uh, work. They eventually get the video package for McGuinness and Danielson uh, highlighting their wars in Ring of Honor uh, with words from Mark Briscoe, Roddy Strong, Jay Lethal, Jerry Lynn. He's thinking of a nickelback. Um, <laughs> always thinking that whenever I see him now because of you. Um, what do you say? It's when Alex Shelley 
Like it's uh it's I wanna say it's Jerry Lynn and Christopher Daniels, but it might be somebody else and they're doing their press conference type thing. Is it with uh Kevin Nash as well? Yeah, it's from the paparazzi production years and just Shelley. It's just so matter of fact. How he cuts across and he says, uh, we don't mind taking down you or Chad Kroger over there. We're going to win this. And it's just like... I think he said the lead singer of Nickelback makes a good point. Uh, oh, let's finish that. <laughs> anyway, they say Nigel McGuinness has always been his own worst enemy. Uh, but McGuinness says he's the best wrestler in the world, not Brian Danielson. This was better than why how I think the TV has unfolded so far. As much as I liked Collision, it was a really good bit. Is bits the way to go? And I don't know why I'm looking you dead in the eyes when I say this, Adam <laughs> Wilborn. Yes. <laughs> but is bits, is bits the way to go for what, like, it's a remarkable, emotionally resonant story in theory. I think they've gone a bit pro wrestling with it, personally, in terms of, oh, the heels saying that, if anything, the baby face is a coward when the heel, in fact, has showed cowardice by picking this moment mm. to, you know what I mean? It just feels like you've be, you haven't betrayed the story. And look, I, I know for a fact, right? Oh, I'm with almost certainty that as soon as they lock eyes in the middle of New York City, it's going to like be really powerful, like really, really powerful. No matter, no matter how few fans are in that building, and yet I think they could have just really went for the goddamn. Tear ducks with all of this. I don't know. It just feels like... It's like the crowded house video that the person made on Twitter. Yeah, exactly. We, we shot that out yesterday. We yeah. said that exact same thing. I think that they could have just... They could have went for an ultra-emotional route, particularly since... I mean, I'm not going to watch that thing. I hope Danielson really sort of beats up this guy who's called him a coward. You can do, you can do that with any wrestling story. This is a completely unique, unpar- like unprecedented pro wrestling story. I think they've gone the wrong way. It's, it's it's one of those, they've gone the wrong way, but the wrong way is still really entertaining. Mm. McGuinness is great at it. I just think that they've missed a trick here. They've missed a trick. This is my favourite thing in AEW at the moment. But I think McGinn- I'm, well, sorry, I didn't complete my thought earlier, and I've just jumped on your dick. No, it's my fault. I'm jumping on your dick. I'm not going to receive McGuinness as a heel, even if he's a really entertaining stooge or whatever. Like He's really good at being bitter and funny with it. I'm just going to be so delighted that the match is happening. I, th- I just think they've missed a trick. But is that not the problem? Like, you think that anyway because you're knowledgeable and educated on what the real story of this is. If they then put that on television, the people that aren't also think that McGuinness is going to be a baby face. They've seen him arrive at Wembley and they've told enough of a miracle comeback story in that one Wembley entrance, let alone what he did in the match, which wasn't much. It was mainly about the moment. Um, is the risk not that you've got Brian Danielson kicking out of carrier bag suffocation and McGuinness is the um, like emotional linchpin of the match like is that not a reason why they've tried to go down this route instead uh, no. because then you've kind of got like you've got a maybe the timing's not right yeah you could argue that like, wrestle, uh, Grand Slam's not the occasion for this niche well it's ultimately a niche match yeah and they've put it on the stadium TV show I would have just done this on a dynamite you know built a dynamite around this mm-hmm. and it doesn't really have the same sense of occasion as Grand Slam, because the whole point is this is a pretty niche story that appeals on a profound level to a smaller amount of people. Don't do this TV stadium show with this. Maybe it's the wrong match for the wrong show, and they've had to work the storyline in such a way that you've missed the entire point of it, really, because you're trying to broaden it because you want to get people into the stadium. I just think this has been misjudged personally. Like this whole thing, and I, I'd still like it. Yeah, I'd look, I, I just I can't wait for it. But again, I'm coming at it not necessarily from just what I'm seeing on AEW TV, which has been good, but it's the whole thing. It's mm. the whole the whole life that you've lived with them along the way, sort of thing. There, what I will say is that uh, I think we're agreeing. Ultimately, we're probably just articulating it in a different way. I honestly believe that AEW have thought we have to book this as heroic comeback versus bastard commentator, because in reality, it's real heroic comeback versus storyline heroic comeback, and that dynamic doesn't fit Danielson McGuinness. I, think I, just, I would have done Maybe it. you're right. Maybe the timing of it would allow... You yeah. could have any version of this you want if it wasn't the f- Danielson's first appearance post All Out. Yeah. I just like, think they're really deluding themselves if they think people are going to really see McGuinness. Look at the pop he got it all in, for God's sake. Mm, yeah. this bitter heel commentator. I mean, the match that this appeals to, people know different, you know? You couldn't have McGuinness... Like, McGuinness would be betraying everything that he's done in character to work to this match if he suddenly then 
dropped it a bit, wouldn't he? You know, the cat, like, I, yeah. Brian, 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 a year of the, yeah. you know, that, like, that betrays a lot. I think they could have just had him. It's tricky. It's a tricky, it's a tricky balance one. to strike. It, it is. is. Tricky, Whenever yeah. you were going to do it, it was tricky because yeah. there was always going to be a lot of sentiment around Nigel McGuinness's return. Mm. But you sentiment understand. around the heel coming back. It's just, you, you know, understand why he's kept yeah. his name in the conversation because he's wanted everybody to manifest this. And I just think when, you, when they've struggled over the past two years to create really emotionally resonant stories, and they have, when you've got one that you don't even have to write, you, you go that way, you go that route. You, you want to get your fans who are watching this saying something to the effect of, you know, making me feel a certain kind of way. <laughs> also, <laughs> is there any chance next week that be, they're able to use the the if Brian's cleared caveat to make this a bit more of an angle rather than a match? Like, I don't want to piss on, like, McGuinness's chips or anybody that's into it, because I am. I'm into it. And I didn't, I'm not a massive Nigel McGuinness guy. I, I expect, am just not as much as I And could I didn't be. expect to be really drawn into this. I yeah. think Wembley has helped that as well. I, I felt something for that. It was yeah. really emotional. He might not have it. Long match wise, he, like the, we're seeing loads of Ring of Honor. The more pathos, the better. Yeah, the more pathos, the better, especially in that match. So do they instead do a thing where Danielson comes out? Somehow they make him up to look like he's barely recovered. It's as if he's just got off the stretcher all out and somehow walked to the venue, and it kind of becomes this a cruel and unusual punishment thing where they end up like sort of there's not really a match match because Danielson is clearly not good to go, and McGuinness is kicking his ass, and then. Even he sort of thinks, like, this isn't even what I wanted. You know, I did like I've wanted you for all these years, but we've been watching these videos of what we did together, and he kind of like, that's ah, not today. And then it's hidden that McGuinness maybe can't do that long twenty minute or something. But Danielson's left in the heap for Christian Cage. Yeah, I don't they, know because it, it feels like we're going to get the match or we're going to get a version of it. But they don't need to give you all of it, do they? Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a McGuinness Danielson proper that they could still actually, yeah, give you if. I don't know. I'd like McGuinness. Like you watch the match back. I love the gauntlet. I loved all of it. Like McGuinness was okay. You would call it respectable more than it was well aged. Yeah. yeah, and he was careful about what he was willing. Maybe he's hiding stuff. We don't yeah. know. But like, yeah, I don't know what like what what even the ceiling is for the match. Yeah, emotionally incredible. That's the thing. That the, it's the emotion rather than the works. So yeah, yeah. You go the emotional route. I just, I'm still into it. I just I kind of wait. It's a trick. Yeah, it's I, it's like you described it. I'm picturing like it's a smaller version of it. But it's for us. It's another Omega Brian, isn't it? Yeah, it's the bit before. I mean, oh my god! Yeah. Like, I yeah. feel like I want to watch it live. It's that yeah. kind of sort of thing. Mox, Gladio, and Rooney Shafir make their way to the ring through the crowd, but they are jumped by Private Party uh, before they can get there. But that does not go well for them. Uh, they get their asses handed them. Shafir sh- chokes out Cassidy. Uh, Claudio hit a brutal-looking backbreaker at one point. Um, Moxley chucks Cassidy into the steps, and Shafir kicks the crap out of him in, and uh, Moxley holds Cassidy as Shavir fires off some more kicks. Then Commander appears in the ring, tries a dive, um, but just gets taken out of the air with a huge Claudio uppercut. Um, then um, there's, at ringside, Alex Abrahantes. <laughs> yeah. yeah! Yeah! I'm Alex Abrahantes! Yeah! Yeah! yeah. I'm, I'm Alex Abrahantes! Uh, he gets chucked all over the place by Marina Shafir, grabs a microphone from his hand. Commander gets sent into the second row by Claudio. Mox grabs a toolbox uh, and pulls out a hammer, saying he could end private parties' careers after pulling what they just did. They've been here since the beginning, but they're in the same spot they were five years ago. So he's going to give them what they've been missing, some friction, an obstacle to overcome. Her. Consider this a gift. And he breaks Cassidy's hand with a hammer, followed by a you sick F chant. Then outruns Darby Allen, who takes out Claudio with a skateboard. Moxie and him go into the ring. Uh, Shafir holds Claudio back. Darby Allen swings the skateboard, but Moxie bails out of there. And Allen grabs a mic and says... Uh, when will Mox re- Moxley realise he's not the same guy he was five years ago? He's going to run through John Moxley and go on to become AW World Champion in his home state come Wrestle Dream. Uh, Moxley just laughs and bails with his gang. Not sure about this. Not sure. Um, it was all right, like the hammer stuff. Um, I'm still asking the ke- question that they want me to ask. Which is probably means it's a success in that. It's like, well, what is it about the company he wants to restore? How far does this rabbit hole go? What 
ultimately does he want from all of this? And I've been told, or shown rather, that there's some kind of complex master plan at work that he's revealing to us a little tiny bit at a time. I remain on the hook. So they come out to make their entrance. I get jumped by a private party. Considering, I know it just felt like, considering that wasn't meant to happen, it didn't feel like it. Moxley, who I hold in the highest regard as a promo, hence why I'm being a pedantic little arsehole about it, he didn't respond verbally in such a way that made it feel like he'd been shaken by this attack or like didn't expect it. I know there's something about the dialogue and the way he performed it that just felt a bit exposition-y and performed. Not like, what are you doing? Mm. Like, you's I do. You know what I mean? I'll, yeah. It just felt like a performed TV segment and Moxley usually brings an energy of, mm. he doesn't do that. Maybe it's, yeah, you're probably right there. I was thinking that I might, the, the promo, I was into the action less so. And I actually didn't like the hammer. I'd have done a wrestling move. I think, like, the hammer was, the sledgehammer was stupid when Triple H used it. I think, whatever it is, whatever uh, it is, he's, he thing is, he smashed his hand with it. Yeah. He hasn't gone, oh, I'll just protect, I'll just use the bit. I'll, oh, I'll yeah. cover it, I'll cover this. I'd, again, maybe it's to do with... Paul not, Levesque's the worst wrestler of all time. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's to do with not quite yet being clear on what the bigger picture is. Mm. But I feel like whatever this bigger picture is that John Moxley is referring to, it's... The, that war is won with all their uh, glass holds and hard strikes. What Marina Shafir is choking out a guy here, the way that, you know, all of their physical gifts, because they're just completely overwhelming people. Um, you know, the, the, even backstage, when that first week, Marina Shafir only chinned a guy. She didn't feel the need to go and grab, like, a weapon, threw him into a crate, you know. But it's, it's, it's like... It's not the end of the world for the character or anything. I was just less into that. I like the promo, but I think when I think about it, I'm probably more along the lines of how you like put it. Like, Other than the, I like what he was saying because I still believe in John Moxley. He's like, you know, if he doesn't care about something, you can see it. And when he does, he does. Yeah. So he's buying into this, which I really like. And I can feel something. I've, I'm trusting it, absolutely. But I do take your point about it being a bit sort of... Uh, it felt like, like wrestling stably. Yeah, wrestling stably, a bit performed. It felt like they had a arranged match with Private Party, who he expected to encounter because he had some words to say about them that were really quite carefully measured and well thought out. And then the match went awry, and then they're just in a post match attack. Like what rattles John Moxley, if not this? Yeah, it's not so much that he was rattled. So I think the whole point is he's a very calculated new John Moxley. But it just felt like he had some... It just felt the words he said at Private Party felt rehearsed. Mm. Didn't just feel like something had happened to him because they weren't meant to do that. They were meant to just talk, you know? Yeah. And uh, I like I, the, what I was going to say. I like, the, in terms of the actual lines, I do quite like the, I'm explaining what I'm doing to you. You can see this as a bigger picture thing or you can take it in the moment as what it is. But I'm doing this thing to you. This greater good philosophy of it is, I think, is still really interesting. Like that sort of, it's, I don't, I'm hesitant to use the word higher power, but it does feel like the fireworks factory with the big picture of Shane McMahon or something else is like they're gabbing us a little bit with it. And I'm interested. There is something <laughs> yeah. more to this, isn't there? There's like there there's is still yeah, a, yeah, yeah. there's still a big reveal mm. along the horizon. That I can AW do incredible stuff with this. I'm immediately taken to the Don Callis Kenny Mega one at John Mox's expense. Yeah, there's an example of a great one that you maybe just can't quite see yet. Mm. So I'm not, you know, I'm not being too critical, but... It's not even my dog. <laughs> Remember yeah. that? It's the best. Just not the hottest week for them. Like, when these, this is a hot act. This right. wasn't hot. Uh, we get a video package of Jack Perry driving the scapegoat bus and defending the TNT title, and then it was time for Ricochet versus... Oh, God, I've forgotten his name. I'm good with faces, no good with names, Sige. The Beast Mortos. Loads of fun, this. Uh, fast start from Ricochet, understandably considering his opponent. Uh, sends Mortos into the corner, but Mortos just charges out with an attack of his own. Um, Ricochet, though, hits a springboard lariat and a sh running shooting star press. He sends Mortos to the floor with a thrust kick, tries for a somersault dive, but Mortos just catches him and hits him with an apron bomb to take us to a break. Um, when we come back, Ricochet's firing back up, but a head spring, uh, hand spring sorry, is caught by Mortos, who hits a huge pop-up Samoan drop for two. Ricochet hits a rewind kick, but Mortos just headbutts him. Uh, Mortos tries for a monkey flip, but Ricochet sends him out to the floor. 
Um, they tried to do the somersault dive spot again, but Mortis missed catching Ricochet, so he just hoisted him up and power bombed him this time. But Good recovery. Yeah. Ricochet floated over into a nice code red. Hits a springboard 450 back inside for a two count. Goes up top, but gets cut off by Mortos, who hits an avalanche gorilla press. Oh, my God. Uh, for two. And then the tilt whirl into the span- spinning backbreaker was countered by a Ricochet into a snap crucifix slam. An axe kick and vertigo for the one, two, three. Yeah, the piece more toss was more impressive than Ricochet in this match, which was less than ideal considering the story they are telling as Ricochet is slowly leveling up to Will Ospreay. I'm not sure about that as the anniversary match. It makes AEW feel a little bit like a nostalgia show. Do you know what I mean? It feels like they are proudly trying to sell a style that is no longer in style. Um, I don't know. doesn't feel representative of where AEW should be, but that's preview fodder, so I'll leave it. Yeah, I thought Beast Mortos was good here. Really good. He always is. I always love to watch him. Ricochet. I mean, I tell you what, the finish here was really anticlimactic. It just seemed to happen out of nowhere. I don't like Ricochet's finish. Me neither. It looks crap compared to the Hidden Blade, the Tiger Driver, or the Stormbreaker, which just... Get up those bloody ropes and jump off them. I know. If, like, dude, that's so what you, that's do what how you like off the top of them and finish with that. He's like got, it's not even a really sick head drop. It looks like he's laboring over the setup and execution. A crap finisher when the guy you're meant to be leveling up to has three that could end a match that smoke it. And talk about the uh, bit with Osprey now? Not really, because I'm not finished. Okay, sorry. Sorry. Uh, I'm just doing a bit. You know. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I get so it. I wasn't that... I, I thought it was good. Not great. I thought it was very good in parts. He's so far away from great. He's so far away from Ricochet, just like you remember him. That's the whole point. We're nowhere near. It's starting to get a little bit... We were talking on the preview, we were trying to be fair of Christian Cage looked sweat-soaked and he took a while to just, oh, he's just Christian Cage's back. CM Punk, he had a great mind for it. The body slam stuff was good. He looked like a tired old man. It worked, yeah, but he did. Mm-hmm. FTR didn't click until 2022. Mm-hmm. There's been previous. Joe. Joe. Yeah, gosh, big one. It's taken a while for some ultimately very successful AEW acts to just get into AEW shape. It really, I mean, you got Takeshita in there, the guy's a monster, <laughs> you know? Um, and, you know, I said at the time I wouldn't sign Ricochet. I don't think he's got the full presentation, the full package. You've got a better, I'd rather watch Takeshita personally, and, you know, I'm proven correct. Um, you know what else is a problem with Ricochet? Other than the fact that this it's a pretty ambitious story, to be fair. <laughs> It's kind of almost harsh. Just be 2010 uh, Dragon Gate Ricochet. Mm-hmm. Oh, Christ, okay. I mean, that's really hard. You know what? I've decided. You know, I've had a problem with his gear this mm-hmm. entire time. So mm-hmm. He needs to change. He needs to just go back to what he used to wear, right? Do you know what he looks like? And this is not good considering Ricochet doesn't look physically up to snuff. With those little f- flared effects. He wears Christopher Daniels gear. He does. Why the flared trouser bit at the bottom? He wears Christopher Daniels yeah. gear. And I'll be in front of you. If you're trying to present yourself as an elite athlete, one of the best in the world at a certain style, you don't want to look like Christopher Daniels. Right. I'm oh. sorry. No offense, Christopher Daniels. You, you, AEW came too late for Christopher Daniels, and that's fine. He's 54 or whatever. You, you can't be looking like Christopher Daniels. Never made that connection, yeah. Uh, it's what it's, uh, it's it wasn't a good look then. I he brought know. in TNA because he'd gone from like the shorts because everybody was dropping that because it was seen as a bit indie riffic. And yeah, I'd put Ricochet back in the trunks, like the the sort of 2016 or the Prince Puma trunks, like the like the really the totally different look, like that really like. thin bit on the waist. Yep. Yeah, the this reminded me of a match. I might be getting a couple of the components wrong or mixing. It's a bit a rough together. at points as well. It was a little bit, but the your point about Ricochet and the Beast Mortos and what this was set out to achieve and what it actually achieved. Like Hologram versus Beast Mortos smoked this. Yeah, was it um, Cody and Matt Cardona versus the Dark Order? And it was yeah, Cardona's yeah. tryout and John Silver got over. Yeah, and John Matt, Silver. We're kicked all talking AS. about. It was like, oh wow, what a great, great coming out party. For John Silver, he's already <laughs> on your book. See you later, Matt. Like, wasn't it Matt Cardona's fault, but it just wasn't his night? And it's like, that's never really how that's supposed to go. Yeah. This, like, this showed you how cool Will Ospreay versus the Beast Mortos would be. 
That's a match I wanted to watch on the back of this. And I, I want to watch. I, like, I'm a bit of a sucker for the nostalgia of Osprey and Ricochet. And I would, I too would have I'm booked not. this. I also would have booked this for the anniversary show in that very, like, online e feddy fantasy booking way. Yeah. Like, you're booking it almost as a mini pay-per-view, mm. and that is that. Yeah. So I'd have booked it. However, the, like, I'm not somebody that fights for the matches all the time. There's a lot of ways to get over with me. Ricochet's got to do it with the matches. Like, he has to. Not, I'm not saying he's even, like, the worst promo of all time. He gets a lot of pelters for his promos. He's been all right in the promos, but I think. it is the matches with Ricochet. blown out of his ass. <laughs> yeah, there's, <laughs> it's the matches that are supposed to tell you on Ricochet matches. Yeah, talk about a promo. It's like he's just been in the G1. <laughs> they get interrupted. He wants to do it, doesn't he? I think he mentioned it. I mean, they all do, don't they? Now I'm in AEW. Adam the Copeland G1. was saying you that, You signed up for it? Yeah, give us a minute. Adam Copeland was talking about it. Give me a break. <laughs> They're hiding from the G1 sign-up sheet like when Dean Ambrose had hide from Vince McMahon. <laughs> right there. Where's the jet? Where's he gone? Penn just like left floating in the air because he sped off so quickly. Uh, Renee later on, yeah, is interviewing Ricochet, but they immediately get interrupted by Will Ospreay who says, look, I apologise for last week. I know there's always been heat between us, but I apologise. Ricochet accepts. Uh, he says, I'm just doing what you told me to do. Get my wins up. Um, everyone's coming after me. I'm more worried about me than they are you, Will, says Ricochet. Um, I expect Will Ospreay to have world class matches, but he's uh, <laughs> spoken to TK and I'm worried about Ricochet. October, <laughs> October second, five year anniversary of Dynamite. He's getting the international title match against Will Ospreay, uh, who might be on another level. But Ricochet is out of this world. Ricochet concludes by saying, "I'll see you real soon, Lil Bro." Uh, yeah, it's not working. It's they, not. They, this story has to work if Ricochet is like performing at this unbelievable standard so well that, oh my God, Will Ospreay used to be his little bro. Maybe Will Ospreay, Will Ospreay's too good and Ricochet's not good enough at the minute. Because the line was right. That is absolutely how you tell the story. It's funny that actually people want to work me. Like, they're not asking for you. That's exactly how you tell the story. Mm -hmm. But like I was just saying, you need the matches to... Yeah, you need the performances. Like, it, it's, you're saying it. That's the right thing to say. Like, it feels false. It feels yeah. like he's, you know... All right, shame. This was better than the um, All Out they did this felt like oh, I do want to actually want to watch this now I didn't really mm. like them interacting in that post all out thing but this was better uh, in amongst all this we got a video package for Hangman Adam Page saying uh, justice delayed is justice denied he'll get what he wants uh, and then he comes out following that Tony Schiavone's in the ring to interview him and get him to explain his actions um, he says uh, what did you mean last week when you said you'd take out anyone who ever defended Swerve or had his back uh, Page said he's watched and listened for a long while um the moment's going to come where Swerve Strickland uh, is finally gone. It wouldn't be uh, just Swerve that has to pay, though. It was those who protected him from me, who was uh, surrounded by them now. Crowd chant Swerve's house, of course. Uh, these people cheered for Swerve Strickland after AW World title defense um, while he was inside a cage before facing his fate. Page said, I was home for four months suspended. I remember a loud voice from the commentary desk, particularly singing the praises of Swerve, and uh, turned suddenly... Uh, on Tony Schiavone, he says, J J Jeff Jarrett. <laughs> Nothing about Jeff Jarrett. Tony Schiavone's footwear. Endearingly bad. Yeah. Uh, backs Tony into the corner, and you think, hang on, Paige is going to kill Tony Schiavone in front of us. But Jeff Jarrett's music hits. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. He runs out. <sighs> they brawl Paige, immediately goes after him, they brawl. I thought Paige always kicks his ass. Yeah, yeah he should. He should. Immediately yeah. chucks him into the barricade, back into the ring, sets up for a bookshop, but in flies the referees and security to separate both of them and then keep trying to get to each other. Um, Jarrett grabs a microphone and says, I'll be damned if I allow you to put a finger on Tony Schiavone. Um, the entire dressing room wants to beat the hell out of you. And I'm front of that line. Uh, I'll kick your ass if it's the last thing I do in my career. Oh, my God. This, I mean, this was, like, let's be real about this. Like, end to end, this was just, like, another fantastic bit of business like with this hangman page character there is that friggin long-haired ass kicking mustachioed cowboy that needs to win that world title and then they need to do something with hangman page like yeah this is the right story this is the right story to tell like the one of the best aw moments of the year is that owen hart match what a rollout an instant rollout of a hangman page match wonderfully executed and performed and devised the whole thing jeff Jarrett was the perfect guy um and the fact that they weren't, in fact, just doing his incredible Owen Hart story for a one-night thing. They were, in fact, doing it for a continuing televised thing, for an all-in gauntlet thing, for this now. Yeah. 
that's like really, really encouraging yeah. in a big picture way. They have gone all the way back and sold you a dream on a Jeff Jarrett promo in the Owen, and here we are now, and all of these things are connected, and it's folded in. Like, realistically, the best character in AEW right now. So it's, it, and I'm not just saying this is like it, my Jeff Jarrett biases. Mm-hmm. This is brilliant. Yes. The, all of this end-to-end and where we're going when Hangman Page is cruelly disposed of Jeff Jarrett is brilliant. Yeah, I love how they are not presenting Jarrett as like this right as equal mm. of Hangman Page. Hangman Page is a bad, bad man, physical, explosive machine. He's kicking Jarrett's ass all the time, as he should. So there's no sense of, you know, the old TNA guy dragging. It's like they're, they're so careful with these things. And more to the point, it's not just a way of just telling you, no, Hangman Page is going to kill him and it's going to be pretty horrifying. He's going to try. He's going to fight. But Jarrett's going to fight. And when he does eventually get some licks on Page, it's going to... I mean, he's so over as a baby face, you know? Now they've plotted this together absolutely fabulously. Fabulously. What a moment. Hangman's going to go for Karen again or something, isn't he? And that's going to fire him up. But now Jarrett doesn't get his proper revenge like he did at Wembley. So Hangman's going to do the awful thing and then win anyway. Yeah. <laughs> you bastard. <laughs> and then, and, you, and it's... This Jarrett is, and a retirement match here. I, I got yeah. a little bit of that there yeah. Yeah, as well. Um, this is another one of those. It's Hangman backing up what he said he was going to do, which is a babyface trait currently being performed by a heel that will one day be a babyface again because he's kept all the receipts. Yeah. Jarrett is a receipt in his mind. Like, his business was conducted with him in the Owen, and then he doesn't care that he went to strike Karen. What happened was Jarrett cost him the title shot at Wembley. It's a receipt. Hangman's got more. There are more people that have wronged Hangman that were not yet being shown, yeah. and it's uh, it's brilliant, man. It's brilliant. Main event time after the Ricochet-Osprey interaction. It was, uh, I suppose, technically, well, yeah, Will Osprey, Carl Fletcher, and Kanosuke Takeshita versus the elite Kazuchika Okada, Matthew, and Nicholas Jackson. Uh, did you hear Excalibur's line on commentary? Uh, Takeshita had the best G1 Climax debut ever this year. And then he said, oh, no, Kazuchiro Okada. What happened when he uh, ended the G1 Climax in his first year? <laughs> first try. <laughs> <laughs> There's been a few Kenny teases lately. Yeah, I know. And he's going to come back with Kuro <laughs> <laughs> I mean... <laughs> You're not the type of person to be pessimistic about things in pro wrestling, Sish. But watching your, like, sort of boom to bust on the Kenny Omega return is really something to me. You know, it's Kenny. Kenny is one of the sort of architects of this new thing of probably could do more than one thing at once, really, in wrestling. Who's to say that he could have a little side quest, like, like the video games, the Kota Ibushi, and then just do some real main event business? Yeah. It can't Everything be that about... Could he himself save AEW's fortunes? I believe he could. Push was the man. He's not only got that, like, come on, it's about time we did it. Yeah, we've done it for a year, and it was like, it's probably your best consistent business. Do it. Do it again. Um, there's that sense of, I think it'll feel like there's a sense of gratitude among the fans that I will finally get it. Mm. Um, and I just think, like, that sense of, as a baby face, he's never once played the ace of the company that exists largely because of him. And I think the fact that it feels so cursed and we might not be able to go again with it, that's just, it's time for him to start being, get Devil Sky. Oh, yeah. In the in the same way that last week they kind of teased, think about it, because in about a year's time, Darby's going to beat Moxley and all's going to be right in the world as the world champion. They've done the exact same thing with Omega Ricardo, haven't they? Yeah. And this time it's the baby face sa- saving something from something yeah. with Omega Okada. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's it's the same thing you've been... Don't stop thinking about that. Yeah. Because we haven't. Not, that better not do it all in. That's all I'm saying. In Dallas, yeah. Two I years wouldn't. Where it's like, all in. Here we go. Oh, no, not, not next year then. Oh. It is going to happen all in in Texas. Son of a bitch. I love missing that match, actually. If I'm missing that match, it means I'm going to a hell of a wrestling show. Yeah. Um... So there's a very early excitement in this match for the, uh, obviously for the uh, Osprey Okada face off to catch it once in. Osprey's like, nah. um, and uh, fun back and forth between the two of them. Obviously, work so well together. And then Takesh is like, right, I've had enough of this. Slaps Osprey in the back. I'm in. Um, bit of an argument breaks out. The elite obviously capitalize on that. And there's a triple slingshot sent on. They pose, they pose on the floor. Uh, but then the baby face is hitting with a triple baseball slide and a slingshot crossbody. All the while, Takesh is like, 
I think you will. Uh, they come back from the break. Uh, Osprey's in trouble in the elite corner, but he gets over to Cole Flitcher, who makes the hot take and runs Ward. Um, Takesh just shoves Osprey's hand away so he could tag in and get his hands on Okada. Um, who he takes out with the Takesh line in a deadlift brain buster. Okada, though, flips out of a blue thunderbomb into a DDT. The books take out Fletcher and Osprey. Takeshi just fights off all three of them because he's mint uh, after some miscommunication from the elite. But then there's a super kick party from the books. Takeshi just no sells that, turns them inside out with a double clothesline. Oh my God. To, feel, feel free to step in here during last five minutes, I will. It's bonkers. Uh, Okada, Okada Bates take Kester into the corner. Air raid crash neck break of a two to take us to another break. When we come back to Kester, still in trouble. The books hit risky business. And then Okada top rope elbow. They all flip off the crowd. Uh, AVP trigger, though, is avoided by Takeshita. Books get hit with the double German suplex. And then oh my God. Takeshita's like, fine, I'll bring in Will Ospreay. Uh, he hits a handsprang Pele kick for to take out both books. The s- standing sky twister press gets a near fall. Oh it's impossible. Mm. Okada avoids an Oscar in a su- kick, super kick party. It's a great oh spot. God. Yeah, get ready. Uh, he's hung on the top rope is uh, Will Ospreay. And Nicholas Jackson hits him with a double stomp. He boings up <laughs> into a sit-out powerbomb from Matthew Jackson. Oh, my God. Ridiculous. It's unbelievable. Gravity to find that. Um, Osprey gets hit with a super kick party after trying a wall walk. EVB trigger gets cut off by Cole Flitcher, uh, who sends uh, Matthew in for an assisted sit out. Pump, spine buster. Uh, <laughs> Osprey for a two count. <laughs> Flitcher <laughs> comes in, wants a tombstone, but Nicholas hits a knee strike. Um, Slice bread gets counted into a sit out double team cutter. Okada comes in, uh, flapjack drop kick on Takeshita. The Rainmaker gets counted into a blue thunderbomb. Takeshita hits a somersault dive outside. Oh my God. Oh, my God. Stay with me. The Bucks want a TK driver, uh, but Fletcher gets out of it. Hit a twisting tombstone on Matthew Jackson for two. Nicholas makes the save. Fletcher eats a super kick. Osprey flies in, though, with a hidden bl- hidden blade. Um, oh timing God. out of this world. And Osprey and Fletcher hit Coriolis. Uh, Fletcher gets the one, two, three. They pin uh, one of the Bucks ahead, of course, of the tag title match next week. Yeah. And we get the United... <laughs> the device now, isn't it? Just what they do. We get a United Empire Tron played. Very clever word. done it there. three times now. In the books. They've pinned the books three times before the match that counts. I mean, that's sub late 2010s fed. Uh, this match here wasn't. Just yeah. a just quick word uh, on the finish. Don Callis comes in to applaud his men and, uh, hey, hey, yay! Osprey holds a handshake and Takeshi just paint brushes him. Good stuff to finish. Well, I'll see that match again. Thank you very much. You seem to be building to that at some point. I thought the last five minutes of this were phenomenal. And my God, I needed them. I don't know whether it's a return to form or or whether they were just in there with Osprey, and I'm not suggesting that Osprey carried them, I'm just saying Osprey at this point is so undeniably incredible that he can bring out the very best in whomever he wrestles. Um, what I've always loved about the Young Bucks is like what they've, their match structure and how when it clicks, it sort of yields an unparalleled, almost impossible level of excitement. What they've done is... There's a legendary 2006 match um, where ROH got the Dragon Gate guys for a super card of honor, do fix from Blood Generation. And this match was so incredible that the fans, once they sensed, ah, no, they're going home here, chanted, please don't stop. Like, please don't stop. Like, they just would, they would have watched it for about another half an hour. As soon as they, ah, because it's built on near fall, near fall, near fall, near fall, near fall, near fall, near fall. It's like, how do you keep doing it? Surely <laughs> you should have reached a point of diminished returns. But that's the magic. It's like, they're, they're, it's going up and up and up and up. And then when it's finally going that, like people went, please don't stop. What I love about the Young Bucks, and it's why I would describe them. One of these days, I'll finish the list of actual pro wrestling geniuses. I think it's absolutely beyond argument. If nothing else, is their approach to business Mm. but in terms of their match structure what they've done is their thing which is surely impossible is that they've taken the last five minutes of that match or the last ten minutes and thought what if we just did that every day (laughs) (laughs) what if we just did the match that was so good people just said please don't stop when it was about to stop so what if we just take that structure obviously you have to tweak it Every single time, which is which itself is this deliriously, ridiculously impossible thing to do, and thought I'll just be our match then. Cool. Well, we'll just start doing this then. It's it. It should be impossible, man. I should get more praise for 
there were so many moments in this where it's like, oh, they keep, they're going, they're going, they're keeping going, they're keeping going. And I was just in love with that feeling, that unbelievable frisson of a young buck's last five minutes. It's like, it's just like heroin to me. It's just so compulsively watchable and dramatic and exciting. And it's like, just how do you add that twist to that little extra detail? How do you think, oh, well, we're going to the finish yet? No, we're not. The rainmaker duck into the double super kick. It's just absolutely unbelievable. If you want to look at it from the storytelling perspective, the, st- the story is I kick your race. Uh, the story <laughs> is they are so incredible at this match where it's like, right, he might duck this. It's Will Ospreay. Let's just get in our let's get in place strategically so we can super kick him right in the dome. Just feels like they map this out as characters. Mm. They know where to be at all times. I just a fabulous last five to seven minutes. That unbelievable young bucks feeling. It felt like twenty twenty one again a little bit, and I was just like that tagged. I mean, mission accomplished for Grand Slam as well. Yeah. It's like now I'm thinking if that isn't a tag team match of the year contender, I'll be sorely disappointed. Yeah, when I said I felt nothing for large parts of this year, this does not include yeah. the main event. Which sort of leads me to my only other thought on this, because it just covered everything. This was wonderful. Um, this is what I'm talking about when I say that a roster is better suited with a bit of range, and I include crap wrestlers in that, as opposed to a lot of ones trying to be as good as this. Yeah. Because it does render. You ju- you just said it, right? And you weren't saying it consciously of what I was about no, to no, say. No, no, no. But it was like, I didn't feel much for this show, and then I felt a great deal for this. A lot of AW tries to be this, and can it be? Yeah. So what are they doing it for? Like, this is... AW will promise you, like, the very, very best version of pro wrestling from a handful of wrestlers, and you got most of them in this match. Yeah, like yeah. The, stick the Beast Mortos in there, Brian Danielson... So Strickland has reached that, that powerbomb thing was just what are the how yeah there are you know you'll have your favorites but ultimately we can all kind of probably name a, a pretty short list of wrestlers that operate at this level and can do it fairly regularly if they want to. I know the books feel like they're turning it off and on a bit at the moment. Okada I think is doing it very consciously by the way, but um, AW's like the rest of AW's roster like the booking still feels like it tells you everybody is this, and it's just not. And yeah. It's, and it's lying to you as a result. And that's why range matters, and that's why, like, you do sort of want... You know, I'm not doing the story thing, but it's why if there is a character that just exists for a different reason or a purpose and the match has a slightly different flavour to it, it's so beneficial. Right now, Danielson's a genius because he's all of it. Yeah. He will give you every single version of any wrestling you want and apply it to the story he's in. I would argue... Um, Swerve Strickland spotted the type of wrestler he needed to be because he wasn't quite one of these, but he knew he could be like a main event mm-hmm. version of it. A and badass. He, and he tweaked himself as a result. Hangman Page is the same. And like, even Sw- Hangman Page can do this. He can do it. I don't even- think Swerve can. I think Swerve's done a great job of reinventing himself. It's like he's grasped, right? I was kill shot. Yeah. I'm way better at that than Isaiah Swerve Scott, who was this kind of wrestler, but an inferior one in NXT. Why don't I embrace the theater of badass? Yeah. And, and I just think. That is, like, this match, in in effect, should be a lesson. It's that frigging, the great footballers that can't make great managers because they can't impress upon the players to just, well, just do what I do. (laughs) Right? This match, like, the wrestlers backstage watch tape. Are you capable of 90% of this? No. Think of a different way to get over. I agree with you, and I've got a take that's ridiculous, but it's along similar lines, okay? So there's the problem of the there are certain wrestlers in AEW who will never be able to do this, and they're just they're deemed they're almost redundant. Sorry, Action Andretti, that type of wrestler, okay? And there's a lot, like Sammy Guevara just pales in comparison. You know, there's a, there is a lot. I agree with Hamlet's point. This is not going to happen, and I'm, not, and I'm being a bit facetious when I say it, right? But it might be the only answer to the, yeah... See this match four years ago, five years ago, six years ago on telly, and you kind of believe your luck. And now it's like, I mean, it was phenomenal, but probably not even TV match of the year. In fact, it's probably fourth on my list so far. You know that old take of people don't understand how impressive Olympic athletes are, what you need to do to really put this across to the viewing public, not that the Olympics ever has a problem, but just to make it even more good, is put schlubs, regular Joes, mm-hmm. not even like grotesquely unfit octogenarians or whatever in there. Put someone from the street in a race, put someone from the street in a pool, and you'll just see, hang on, these are <laughs> yeah, these yeah. are aliens. Put deliberately bad matches on Dynamite. Put deliberately bad di- Dynamite matches on the program, and then put this on. You'd really get a perspective. Yeah. Like that. I mean, that powerbomb. Uh, it's re- it's preposterous, man. 
but bad matches on. <laughs> <laughs> there are good matches from the days of yore that are significantly not as good as this that get held off and talked about years later because you had Midian and the Boss Man and Visceron <laughs> and the gods. Was Dean Malenko versus Scotty Too Hotty that good? Do you see two better matches at a minimum a week better than that? Yes, you, you do. do now, yeah. That match will get remembered because what else is on that undercard, really? Put bad matches on TV. Hell of a way to close out this show. And sorry, yeah, it doesn't mean that characters can't get over within those bad matches. Yeah, no, as well. no, 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 no. Wrestling. Yeah. Like, it's yeah. a bad match is just as part of the buffet as a good one, yeah. realistically. But yeah, like, good characters can still thrive in yeah. that environment. But it, you really can't turn into slow it down, kid, can you? But. Slow, slow it down, down kid. Kid. Slow it down, <laughs> action, Andretti. Uh, well, let us know your thoughts on that and uh, all of AW Dynamite in the comment section below or on X at What Culture WWE. You actually can follow all three of us. You can follow Michael Hamflet at Michael Hamflet. Follow Michael Sidgwick at oh, God, long boy today. I am Sidgwick. <laughs> follow me at Adam Wilborn. Follow us all at What Culture WWE. Uh, and make sure you subscribe to What Culture Wrestling wherever you get your podcasts from for daily wrestling podcasts. Uh, but for now, this has been the Dynamite Review. My thanks to Hamlet Sidgwick. Thank you for joining us and we will see you soon. <laughs>